My name is Nate Lewis, and my day job was an intensive care unit registered nurse. I, um, I started working at Inova Fairfax Hospital. Um, I started working in a medical surgical intensive care unit upon graduating in 2008. And um, I worked in a, a critical care stroke unit for a year. And then I worked in a neuroscience surgical intensive care unit for four years. And then I worked in um, a, a post like critical care unit, like after a lot of surgical procedures um, unit for like three years. So it was a, a wide array of understanding what care is. And I also worked in an emergency room when I was um, in nursing school. Uh, I worked just as a patient transporter, but I was there and I was still taking it all in and I participated in CPR and other things. Um, so I, you know, it was interesting to be able to see what care is from beginning when you come in the ER and then um, to, you know, a point of um, surgical procedures and all the different types of understanding, you know, the body and understanding the emotions that happen with different uh, systems and um, the imbalance of them within families and the patients. Yeah, you really encounter people in such a difficult time and such a stressful or vulnerable time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, the ER is, that's like, there's no buffer there. Nothing. It's like, this is the crisis, the beginning of it. There's no, um, that's just where the surprises, you know, happen for everybody. A lot of people come to the ER, it's like an emergency. We didn't know this was going to happen. And the healthcare workers have to deal with that at, at that point, which is really intense. Um, but in the ER, it's like they're there and then they, and then they move along, you know, and often to wherever, where I was in the ICU. So, you know, we get them early in that point, but then you see processes play out if that's getting better, if that's not. Um, and yeah, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. Roughly how many years was that uh, altogether that you were in this line of work? It was like 10, about 10, 10, 11 years. Did you just stop this past year? Is that right? No, I stopped in 2017, like March 2017. So yeah, I've been away from it for about five years. What is it like being away from it? Do you feel like you're reflecting on the experience differently with a little bit of distance? Do you feel like it's still impacting you in the way that you move through your work and move through the world? Yeah. I mean, when I was, um, when I was working in the hospital, I was really still like in this place of just thinking about um, just that, you know, mainly about like mortality and that, yeah, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't thinking about like moving through life or thinking about like what is happening externally, like outside of like the hospital, you know, it was those, it was that really intense, intense, acute place. Um, as I've gotten away from it, as the years, yeah, getting out of it, it's like, I'm able to, yeah, think outside of that. And like, let me think about <laughs> other elements of the world, but it really, um, it was difficult to do that because, um, yeah, I just, I was like convicted about that place. And like, that was my world. And that was like me, you know, I guess sitting with that and that was more important than anything to me at the time. Yeah. I think it can be disorienting to step away from that much intensity. Um, especially when it's so overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, I, I wean myself off cause like, I was for the past the past three or four years I worked, I only worked one to two days a week. So I was yes, yeah, so I was weaning myself out of that. But I think I just bring that intensity to my art practice. <laughs> so it kind of like was this transference, really. And um, but it was it was the only way I I mean the conviction to you know, make in the way in which I do. And I think to see in the way that I'm able to see and understand and assess and um, draw connections is, I think it's, I mean, I know it's because of, it's because of that work. That's where the, um, 
the conviction was made. So, I mean, that's the only reason why I was able to just dive into into the practice that I that I did and be so committed to it, really. Hmm. That's really interesting. Thinking about the dedication it takes to go into this line of work is a dedication that you've then brought into your artwork too. And you were making artwork the entire time you were working in intensive care. Can you talk a little bit about how you found time to make artwork and how, where that fit in your schedule? Yeah. Yeah. So I started, I started drawing in 2010. That was probably the second year into um, working as an intensive care unit nurse. And the beautiful thing about it is that, you know, intensive care, it's only um, it's three days a week. I mean, working as a nurse, it's three days a week, if as long as you're not taking on like overtime and everything. Um, and I didn't, I didn't start until like two years into it because like the first year or so is, I mean, starting to work on the medical surgical intensive, intensive care unit, it was pretty grueling. Um, it was very hard. It was incredibly hard on me mentally, um, emotionally. And um, yeah, I don't think I could have like, the days off I could just be like, oh, I was, let me like start drawing or something. Like it was a lot and I was studying a lot still, you know, there was, I mean, I was still, I had classes while I was working in ICU. Um, so yeah, but after, yeah, after two years, I was like, okay, like I'm settled in. And um, yeah, three days a week full time and then I have four days off to do what I want, which is really amazing. And a lot of that was dedicated to starting to draw. I want to talk a little bit more about the way that you make work. You've spoken about the influence of like heart rhythm prints and diagnostic imagery and medical illustrations. Can you tell us a little bit about how those come into your imagery or how those come physically into your work as, as uh, found materials as well? Yeah. So like when I started drawing after like I, like learned how to draw a little bit. I was, um, I was, I just want to draw what I want. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I ended up drawing um, organs like of the body and I drew <laughs> musical instruments as well. And I like, yeah, I loved, loved music. And I, I played the violin for some time, like my last year of college up till I was like 27. And I was very much into music. That was my, like, that was like my art of the art of listening and just understanding sound and all across all genres, all ethnicities, all language, like that was the most interesting thing to me. So I, yeah, I drew organs and instruments and then I started like bringing them into like concepts. So I had like a set of lungs that like came out of like a trumpet and um, I drew like a phonograph with like red blood cells coming out and um I had a bagpipe that sat on top of like intestines and actually bagpipes were made from animal like stomachs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, it was something I started doing on my sister side of the imagery and she's like, yo, this is cool. You should start a t-shirt line. So I started a t-shirt line <laughs> and it was cool mm -hmm. and it was fun. And she helped me and we did sculpture. She did sculptures that I helped her with and all kinds of stuff. So that's where I started. And then after that, um, like maybe two two years in, I was interested in more. And my sister's an artist, and so is my brother-in-law. And my sister worked with paper. And so I was thinking like materially, um, you know, as well. And so I started collecting um, uh, heart rhythm strips from patients that I took care of in the intensive care unit. And I took these strips, these rhythms, um, and which were like like a receipt. It comes out of the little machines um, by the patient's bedside whenever the heart rhythm is high, low, irregular. And then you have to come assess the patient, assess the rhythm. So I was making pieces with them, just um, like maybe like, it would be like three strips, like right under one another. Um, and I was playing around with just like collage elements, like um, just uh, collage and paint and little elements. And I was like, there was nothing else I wanted to do than make work with patients heart rhythms like i thought like this is the pinnacle for me <laughs> i'm like what is more important than this um because that's you know that's so where i was so what happened was those pieces started getting uh they weren't archival so they started getting dots and things on them it was like chemical thermal paper i didn't know about this stuff 
So I started working with a good friend. He was like, well, just scan them into the computer, blow them up big, and then you can work on them how you want. And um, I was against it at first because it wasn't like the actual material, but I was like, okay, I'll try it. And from doing that, that's how I started working with paper as a material. What I realize is now is like in my practice, like I'm like, I'm constantly just trying to find that rhythm. That's what I'm trying to find because I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have had these breakthroughs with paper if it wasn't for um, going to those rhythms, you know? And so in whatever, like in all I do, it's like finding that, it's trying to find that, that rhythm, you know? Can you tell me a little bit more about how the word rhythm is, is working for you? Because I feel like there's so many different ways you can hear it, right? Whether you think about it as a pattern or something that's intuitive, something that is necessarily sonic, or something that is really deeply embedded in the body and the body's own rhythms and the heartbeat and, and those systems. When you're thinking about rhythm, which of those channels are you thinking on or how are you thinking about that word? Yeah, I'm definitely thinking about it on all those channels and more, for sure. And I'm really starting to understand that as I really um, am able to come into myself as a as an artist, really. Like I said, I only started drawing in 2010. Maybe I started thinking like an artist, like really maybe a few years later. When I came to Pioneer Works for the residency, when I moved to New York City, is like a, a it was like a new chapter of like, okay, this is what an artist is. And I'm really starting to now realize and like allow those ideas to expand, you know, into life in general. Finding that rhythm for me, it's definitely has to deal with, um, you said sound. It so has to do with sound. And the interesting thing, you know, about, about a heart rhythm, I thought about it and I'm like, well, this is like your first representation of something that you've worked with. Because it's a visual representation of, you know, of a heart, um, of a sound. It's a visual representation of something that is physical, that you can feel. And it's also a visual representation of the mechanics within. And, you know, and a specific code is applied to that. And because I understand and I learn that, that language of that heart rhythm, like I can read that. So I can, I can read this language that is foreign to somebody, but like I was willing to read that. So it is, it's that, it's sound, but along with the heart rhythm, I mean, there's the sound of lungs, you know, and we gotta, you have to listen to the heart rhythm. You have to listen to the rhythm of, of lungs that tells us different things. Um, pulses that tells of different things and then just rhythms and patterns we'd have to pay attention to patients um especially working in the narrow icu the, the cognitive patterns you know of people it's the hardest icu to probably work in is i mean one people don't really like is the narrow icu because it's not it's so subjective it's like oh they kind of moved like this but they weren't moving like this their speech changed a little bit um like they're just a little off and you have to be able to sense all of those things, you know? So that's like within the body, but I think the understanding the body, it taught me, it taught me assessment and it taught me systems and it taught me history. So, you know, I apply my understanding of the human body and all of its different systems. Um, and then you think about the human body and you think about its relationships to other lineage of human bodies, right? Of their mother, of their grandmother, of that. And then you apply these understandings to the world. You apply it to a state, a county, um, a country. And then, and then you're thinking about, on a grander scale, you're thinking about a specific city, a specific geographic area, you know, you're thinking about the migration, you're thinking about the circulation, you're thinking about sound, you're thinking about the music that was produced in this place. And what was it 20 years ago? But what was happening over in, in whatever, in Europe? Well, this was going on in the United States. So it really taught me assessment and it taught me how to think about the world in this way of just understanding drawing and understanding the, the interrelationships, you know, of everything. So that's that's that rhythm. You think about weather and the rhythm that weather plays into geographic locations and 
what is born out of that, what food's born out of that, what movement is, what dance. And now it's like, it's all starting to come together. Yeah, it's the system of interrelation that sort of begins with rhythm in the body and the heart and then kind of expands almost like a fractal into the rest of the way that we think about the world, right? The way to think about societies and natural systems. That's a really, really lovely sequence to sort of think through. You you talk a lot about assessment and you've used this other word in some of your previous interviews that it's diagnostic and that the the practice of drawing and patterning or cutting into paper is kind of a diagnostic practice. And I was wondering if you're thinking about your art practice as diagnostic, what are you learning? What are you learning about the body or what are you learning about paper or what are you learning about sort of yourself as an artist through this diagnostic act of cutting and drawing? I guess it's a, there's a, a few different things to it. Um, cause I guess the language that I think about I'm using is like, uh, I think about like a language from like a diagnostic lens and I mean, that's a specific language, but for the most part, it's an unknown lang- language to what most people look at it. And it's, um, it's, it's a new language and it's one that you have to be willing to, willing to understand, willing to learn really. And these diagnostic languages that they created, you know, were intended to, to be like in the, in the name of care, really, um, in the name of care, in the name of understanding and in the name of how these different, um, these different languages that they use for this lens, this way of understanding relates to another one. And it's about finding, finding that balance really in that truth. So I think about my practice as not like, um, like telling you like how to think about something. And that's why I don't try to make it look like one sided. And really, I think it's more than anything, the ideas, especially if you're playing with political ideas and ideas where people are polarized, then it's really like something about like diagnosing, understanding oneself, really. It's about understanding oneself, I think, because it's like most things I might have thought a certain way and about something. And I, I, I mean, and I did, you know, my whole life because I wasn't educated about, you know, about truth in, in so many ways. I mean, you know, a lot of us grew up in the United States learning a specific nationalism, right? So for me, it teaches me to put a microscope on myself and why do I think this way and why am I closed off to learning about things this way? So really, I think it, it's like, um, it's about understanding yourself really. Yeah, absolutely. The act of diagnosis is not about extracting a single fact, but remaining curious and this sort of constant practice of curiosity, right? Absolutely. Um, you, it's funny that you, you touch on, Um, the gaps in your own knowledge and and being really introspective through this process, because I found such a recurring theme of empathy, both in the way that you work, but also the way that you talk about your work. Do you feel like that, that link of empathy is learned in the ICU in dealing with so many different people at their most vulnerable? And then do you feel like your audiences do tap into that empathy or do they struggle to take it in and want to sort of squeeze your work into a more polarized or simplified uh, statement? Yeah. So for me, empathy was something I learned. It was absolutely something I learned. And I remember um, because I worked in an ICU and then um, for like a year and then I took a, or like, and then I took some time and I worked in the stroke unit for a little bit. And it was like, It was a little bit less, it wasn't as intense and like patients could walk and talk. And I was used to just like playing with these strong drugs and like keeping people alive. And um, in that, like in that, you know, the, the, the adrenaline. And my mother told me, she's like, maybe you're working in this unit because you need to learn empathy and you need to learn to really care for people. And I was like, I'm like, oh, Bob. <laughs> but when she said it, when she said it, I was like, interesting. And sure enough, there was a time I, I, I like really remember it when it um when it happened, and I was like, oh wow, okay. And I I I specifically remember it, and 
from there on, um, I kind of like, um, I leaped into it because it was like this new, it was this new way of, of caring and seeing and understanding and something that was important for my job as well. Cause I always kept like, I always kept like a distance, you know, with patients and families. Cause they're like, Oh, you don't want to get too involved personally because it's so much to take on. But I guess I wanted to see, see what that was really. And I, I felt like I was keeping too much of a distance from, uh, yeah, from being really present how I, how I needed to. So, um, that was kind of the place that I made from, like this vulnerable and empathetic place when I first started working with the rhythms and first started working with paper. And that was like, you know, I probably wrote about that and prayed about that. And that was like something I really, yeah, I really wanted to summon into. I feel like, yeah, that was like the only, was the only reason why I was able to make the work that I did really. It was so much, it was so much bigger than me. It was so much bigger than art. It wasn't about art. It was just like, I didn't know what like was happening in the art world. Like, what? What are you talking about? I'm just making what I want to make, you know. Um, I think, yeah, I think people people say really, really deep things to me about my work, and they say, "Oh, I, I see it all. Like, I feel it all." And and even with the like the polarizing ideas that I'm working with, a lot of people say, "Like, no, you you strike the balance like really, really well." And I've heard some people even say who I know who are artists themselves and have like deep connections to particularly the South in regards to like the monument pizza, like they're too beautiful for me. They're too beautiful for me. And I wasn't surprised, you know, when I heard that um, this person said that to me, I'm like, I'm not surprised. I, I completely understand, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. I'm really interested in your your particular use of beauty because so much of your work is so beautiful, right? There's this really lush treatment of patterning. There's this really delicate mark making. The the values that you use are really compelling, um, but they're also quite abject, right? In many of the images, we're seeing entrails and we're seeing body parts, and there's this this notion of the body and it's in its viscerality that comes through your work. How do you think about the abject and beauty? Do you see them as entwined? Do you see them as intention? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the shell, the outer can often be beauty, beautiful and intact and appear as if everything is going well and everybody can agree you know, this is that this is all going well and they can all essentially, you know, believe a believe a lie. People come in, you know, people would come into the hospital and they look fine. They look great. But internally, it's like, oh, what's happening? All of these really horrible, bad things are going on with your body. And they don't have to manifest on on the outer, on the skin. You can have really damaging things going on, even like with your heart and with like things, you know, things, activities, practices you're doing and like you don't, you don't know. I mean, thinking about society, I mean, should think about the history of, of this country and thinking about the church and like, uh, I mean, so much, so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of these surfaces, we could look at, at social stories and social myths as a kind of skin, right? And you've been looking at cutting into the skin visually or conceptually to explore what is both beautiful and abject and and sort of wounded but also you know fractally connected within that space and then it, it feels like you're also cutting into the social skin cutting into the social fictions in very much the same way absolutely absolutely and to keep it to keep it beautiful on the outside is speaking to the spectrum of of beliefs regarding you know an idea so it can draw everybody in in this way and speak to them. It's like, yeah, this is how I feel about it. But why, why is it like this? Why are the guts coming out? Why mm -hmm. is... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it evokes something in us, even if we don't always understand what it is or why. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to um, the particular piece of yours that we're going to be exhibiting at the Blanton and Day Jobs. Um, I was wondering how much you remembered about it. It's uh, Signaling 23. Um, do you remember that piece? Do you have an idea of where you were at when you were making it with some of the ideas inside of that one might have been? Yeah, I was, um, 
I was, that was 2019. Yeah, it was 2019. I think it was completed in 2020 as per the tag we oh, have Oh, completed on it, 20. Yeah. Okay. No, mm-hmm. that that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> it was right before, yeah, it was leading into like my first solo in New York. Um, I took the photo when I still lived in, in D.C. Um, or maybe it was like a year after I moved out of D.C. It was somebody who I've been, a close friend of mine who I've been working with. And um, I was starting to understand some processes in the work, um, the, the fabric rubs with the graphite and the paint, you know, that I was using um, the process. And there were some other processes in the work that I was just starting to like really, um, really dig in and understand um, more than I, I did previously. And the piece is... Um, the person is like not really in movement, just kind of like a, just kind of like a pose. I was starting to just move, really get the work to to move outside of like just these slow positions, really, and starting to be able to think about, um, think about greater uh, ideas outside of um, where I where I was, you know, in these still. Uh, places. When I made that piece, I was outside of thinking about the hospital. It was just about um, the the exploration, really, at that time. So, yeah, but it was, um, I loved, I really loved that piece. Um, It was a really, it was a, it was a really strong piece and it was definitely um, a shift happening. Yeah. Yeah. We really love it too. And seeing the shift in your, your exploring of materials, your exploring of composition and form sort of out of the language of this earlier work. And then that language is being organized into new syntaxes as you're moving through it. Right. Yeah. Processes to me are, it's a new way to, to, it's a a new way of thinking and understanding something. Um, A new way to see a new way to, um, to bring different ideas together. Just thinking about things in a more, you know, in a complex way, just like, just like thinking about processes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Something uh, intuitive, but also automatic and, and, and very pragmatic about how some of this imagery comes about while also being beautiful. Um, as you know, the, the exhibition day jobs focuses on the work um, and another way that work not only supplements, but also informs people's creative careers. Um, Do you think you would have arrived at this kind of work without the career that you had? Or or do you feel like there's, and there's a sort of second question, do you think that any young artists listening into this episode who are concerned that they're not really making art because they're also working outside of the art field, um, what might you tell them about how your job and your artwork might have been interconnected. Yeah, I would have never arrived where I am, like at all. It wouldn't have been possible. I mean, I arrived where I am because of being, you know, a completely self-taught artist and because of other deep practices that I, I engaged in when I was younger. And it's interesting because in the beginning, I was like, oh, I got to stay away from, I can't be too close to this um, this medical background, this nursing background. I'm like, I got to keep some distance. And people were encouraging me to like dive into it more. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> but now, but now I'm diving deep into it. And um, yeah, really understanding it's like, well, this is, you know, this is what makes you, you. And this is what really can draw out like your most authentic self as an artist. So to me, it's like really an advantage to have have a lived another life other than an artist and to be able to come into it. And um, if you really, you know, understand how to harness that to the best of uh, your ability and in whatever way that is. Yeah. Yeah. I, you've mentioned in, in previous interviews that some of your basis for empathy and curiosity about society come from your own multiracial background as well. And I wonder if that's part of your your interest in synthesizing different areas of your life into sort of one product and thinking across all these different languages, whether they're 
technological languages or cultural languages, physical languages that you're you're used to sort of bringing them in and finding how they relate to each other. As a multiracial person myself, I often find myself really engaged in those moments of synthesis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, being multiracial and growing up with um, people on both sides of the spectrum and um, trying to trying to voice, you know, your, your thoughts, your opinions on these particular ideas and um, seeing them not resonate and, and then having like a president like Donald Trump and then people become even more polarized. It's like, oh my gosh, like, do I have to stop talking about family? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's like, you know, um, I think a lot of people probably went through that. Um, I mean, not even across races. I think a lot of people went through that. But, like, I'd rather try to fight and try to educate one another, really. And I think that's what it is, you know, constantly just trying to build build bridges, really. Um, and that's why, um, yeah, that's why there is this empathy thing. Because, I mean, I know where I grew up, and I know how I thought. And it was because I grew up where I grew up. Mm-hmm. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's it's not complex. Like... <laughs> Mm-hmm. It it is it is complex. It is complex. Actually, it's very complex. But at the same time, um, man, sometimes it's it's just that like you went around these particular like type of people in the United States. It's full of so many different countries. Um, so yeah, I have I have a lot of grace and I have a lot of grace and empathy. Um, probably a lot more than than others, you know, um, but people have different limits of, of what that is. And I was, you know, I respect them all. Yeah. Yeah. It, it shows up, I think in, in what you've, what you've been taught, you've learned so much over the course of your work. You've learned so much over the course of your personal experience and then being able to reflect on it and to articulate it in this, uh, really beautiful aesthetic way. I think, I think empathy comes through and curiosity really yeah. strongly in your work empathy and curiosity yeah nate lewis thank you so much for joining us i hope that our visitors can enjoy seeing your work at day jobs thank you so much so glad i could participate in this